All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Monica Harris. I'm executive director of the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, and I will be moderating our webinar today. Uh, this is only my second week as ED, but um, I'm already blown away by all the moving parts it takes to keep this organization going and the dedicated staff of hardworking folks like Carrie Mendoza and a host of volunteers who are all passionately dedicated to supporting FAIR's mission of advancing civil liberties, and more importantly for today's conversation, ensuring that the rights of parents and children are protected and respected. Um, as a parent of a 14-year-old boy and as a gay woman, I happen to have a special interest in the subject matter we'll be discussing today. So uh, today we're going to take a deeper, deeper dive into the roles that schools play in social gender transition and ask some pretty fundamental questions that I think are likely on a lot of parents' minds now, like um, what are some school policies conflicting with parental rights? Um, how do school policies impact gender dysphoria care? And uh, what is the path forward given these um, uh, concerns and very passionate concerns on both sides? And uh, our panelists today are Tanya Simmons. She's FAIR's Director of Chapter Networks and a school board member and a mother. She has a deep experience working with parents and administrators on very complex school issues of all nature. We also have Josie A, who is a mother of a trans identifying, identifying son, and she's also co-editor of the Pitt book, and Pitt is Parents uh, with Inconvenient Truths About Trans. And the book is called Parents with Inconvenient Truths About Trans, Tales from the Hope from in the Front to Save Our Kids. Um, and she's also co-founder of the Pitt Substack. Our next panelist is Lydia. She is a mother of a trans identifying son and a college professor. And finally, we have Jennifer, Jennifer who's the mother of a deceased daughter who was socially transi transitioned at school without Jennifer's knowledge. And she is the co-founder of Parents for Ethical Care Com. So um, I think we're going to get started with uh, our first panelist, Lauren. And Lauren, if you could just please describe for us what, what social transition of gender means. Sure. Hi. And I, first of all, just want to say thank you for um, having me. I'm actually... <clears throat> Uh, fellow um, with FAIR um, and FAIR in medicine. And so I'm here as a psychiatrist, but also as a as a mom of three. And um, that's what brought me to FAIR in the first place. And so just wanted to say thank you for having me and I'll try and kind of chime in and hopefully add kind of a piece of education um, from medical and mental health aspects of things um, as we move along. But so first of all, just to address what social transition is, I know a lot of us here have a tremendous amount of experience with it, but I think when we look at what it is, I always want to reiterate right out of the gate that this is a therapeutic intervention and it's a pretty significant one. Um, so whether it's teachers, um, school administrators, et cetera, if they're involved in a social transition of a child, they are absolutely participating in a therapeutic process. Um, so what we look at social transition being, it's a it's a public adoption of a new gender identity as it relates to gender, gender presentation, gender expression, you know, and we'll dive into some of that more. Um, what I also clarify um, when I'm talking about it is it's not the same as a child exploring new styles or their persona or stretching and growing developmentally as they develop their identity formation, which we know it, that occurs kind of all the way through full brain de development, which finishes out around age 25, 26, 27. Um, it generally can include um, a change of name, change of pronouns, for example, changing from she, her to he, him, or they, them, and then a change of the gender expression itself, which kind of to dive into what that is, you know, you're looking at outward expression, including clothes, style, hair, grooming. Sometimes you'll see children adopt different mannerisms um, that are believed or they believe represents um, the gender um, that they feel better matches up with them in that moment. Um, it also can involve binding and tucking, which we don't know has medical um, implications or can. 
Um, it can also involve, um, and often does, and what we'll be talking about more is that social transition involving the person coming out, you know, the child coming out as transgender gender to their school, to their family, to their friends, community. And what that does is then it loops in participation of a much larger group. Um, and we can talk about some of those psychosocial impacts that it can have, um, certainly through a child's development and the development of their friends of their, so we can talk through some of that as well. But um, again, just reiterating that is it is a powerful psychosocial intervention that warrants a tremendous amount of robust support. Um, so hopefully that answered. It, oops, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Monica. Hold on. Sorry about that. I put myself on mute because I was shuffling pages. Uh, <laughs> Tanya, Tanya, question for you. Um, how do you think the push for social transition in schools has impacted school boards um, and parent-teacher school relationships? You have a lot of experience dealing with school boards on a number of different issues, not just this, but in particular, how do you think it's um, impacted this relationship? Yeah, it's been very challenging. So school boards do have to comply with all legislation, right? So to the extent that there are legislative policies being um, developed and being passed, um, that is something that school boards have to comply with. And if we think about the historical context of um, education, the teacher-child-parent relationship, it is instrumental that the teachers and the parent have a really solid, strong working relationship in support of the child. So um, this has really um, become a challenging issue um, because the school should not be in the middle um, between a child and a parent. Um, and in fact, they should be seeking to strengthen those relationships um, for the benefit of the student. Um, so this is just a general qu question from any of our, our parent panelists, uh, Jennifer, Lydia, Josie. From a parent perspective, can you please share with us when you learned your child secretly transitioned at school? In other words, transition with the the assistance of a parent or administrator without your knowledge. Can you just sort of like walk us through the process of your understanding of how it had occurred and when it first came to your attention? And I guess also the uh, subsequently what happened uh, when you confronted um, administrators and teachers with this knowledge? Well, this is Lydia. I can I can answer this first if I'll be brave. Yes. Um, so we discovered what was going on um, during the first year of the pandemic shutdown where we are. So that was in about October, November of, um, oh, geez, that pandemic was so long ago and yet so recent. Uh, the, during the first year of the pandemic, when was that, 2020, something like that? 2020. 2020 March. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So our, our, um, our schools got shut down here right away. So March, 2020, um, looking back now, it's pretty clear that he had socially transitioned at school sometime before the pandemic that we were not made aware of. Uh, he was 14 at the time. We found out that he had been socially transitioned, um, at school when he told us right before parent teacher conferences were going to happen in October of 2020. And so we actually never found out from the school hmm. when he had made this announcement. But what we do know is that he was in a group of about 20 to 30 kids at his school. So his, his grade level, it's a small private school, um, had about 150 kids in each grade level. So about 30 of them were identifying as trans at this point. And he had adopted a new name at school. He wanted to use the cross-sex facilities, which we were asked if we were okay with. We said, absolutely not. We're not okay with this. They did it anyway. Um, we said, we're absolutely not okay with them changing his name at school. They did it anyway. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's now, you know, 2023, we've been dealing with this for three years now, and um, we've never gotten consistent, honest information from the school about how this happened, why it happened. And, you know, I've had many conversations with the school about how dangerous this is, how disruptive this is, and honestly, how they can say that a fifth of the grade is actually trans 
is beyond ridiculous to me, but I have theories as to what's happening, but to sum it up, yeah, this has been going on for three years with us and everything we've said no to, and they've just done it anyway. And we've never gotten a honest, uh, clear feedback from the school about why, why they're doing this and um, what our role in their mind even is. You know, it's interesting um, that you mentioned the pandemic. It seems to me that gender dysphoria has been like ramping up in general for the past decade, but something happened right before and in the year and during and in the years immediately, you know, following the pandemic. And I've often wondered, I don't know if you have any insight or thoughts on this, but what is it about the pandemic, though, the the feelings, the I guess the emotions, just the entire environment that may have made kids more predisposed to gender dysphoria? Or am I imagining that? Do you think there's not a connection at all? There absolutely is a connection. Okay. I think that there's a combination there. I think part of it was the fear. Everybody was very, very afraid. And these kids are uh, in a very difficult time as teenagers where, again, they're trying to formulate their identity. And now this big catastrophe happened and they can't see their friends and they're not in the world. I think coupled with that, they were disassociated with their bodies because they're having to do everything in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. They're online all the time. They don't live in their bodies anymore. They're just a brain on the internet. And I think the third thing is, is the indoctrination online is real. It's intense. And it's very, very difficult for teens, especially smart, introspective, emotional teens to distinguish when people are telling them the truth and when they are manipulating them. And when you have a smart teenager, which a lot of us do, they are so sure that they would know when they're being manipulated, that when they're being manipulated, they've got no clue. And the last person they're going to listen to is stupid mom and stupid dad who don't understand what the young people know all this stuff about and they don't know anything. So I think that it was just a trifecta or quatreca. I don't know how many different right. things that came together all at the same time to cause a whole bunch of kids to just completely disassociate from reality. And then the, all the adults are just going along with it. And that's the part that blows my mind. Yeah. And I can chime in just to add to that, Josie, I think what we saw so much is mental health symptoms in general um, became, you know, exacerbated, um, like Josie mentioned, fear, um, but also feeling so isolated, so withdrawn at the same time, parents scrambling, oftentimes we oftentimes we'd hear parents are working online as kids are online in school, not really having the ability to keep a closer eye on, okay, every second of every day, what are they looking into? Um, and additionally, I agree, there's so much online for any anyone that's taking care of kids, whether it's you're a parent or you're a teacher or you're a counselor or a psychiatrist or pediatrician, you need to know what these kids are reading online because they see online influencers as the experts. Um, and then they see social media as 100% reality versus this is what a person's presenting to you in those moments that they're on TikTok. Um, so there's so there's so much that came together that no, I don't think you were um, you were making it up. I definitely think the pandemic definitely paved the way for some of this. You know, it's interesting. I, I notice I reflect back on my experience with uh, with our son and. So um, the first time I should say when he was exposed to pornography, he was in he was in fifth grade, and it was because of the pandemic. Everything was being done on YouTube, and we found out quite by accident. So it's 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 I'm wondering it's sort of like this cross intersection of um all sorts of sexualization, from sexual orientation to just you know just general exploring of you know, pornography that happened during the pandemic. It's something we don't talk about nearly enough. Um, but, and additionally um, recognizing right now, pornography has become so violent and so yes. disturbing, even I think to many adults that come across it and can't unsee it, but children don't recognize that this is not the reality either of what maybe an intimate adult relationship is when you're developmentally ready for it. Um, and when kids are so young and exposed to it, oftentimes I do see a dysphoria develop around what they they see as gender, but really and truly it might be, I'm not ready to be a sexually active adult and they shouldn't be, right? They're 
eight or 11 or, and so, or even 14, 15, I mean, some of this stuff is really rough to, to know that they're out there grappling with it all alone. So I agree with that for sure. Uh, Josie, Jennifer, do you have any, anything to add about uh, when you first learned your child was transitioning? Um, sure. I can talk. Okay. Um, this is, uh, this is Josie. That was Lydia before. Um, my, I, um, my son, um, told us in 2019 that he was trans and it was sort of a perfect storm of being cut from a sports team and lose, losing his friend group from middle school. And then the, and then COVID hit. So it was sort of a, just everything involved. So what happened was he was home and um, he had told, emailed his um, counselor, which I didn't know at the time, but he had emailed the counselor saying that he wanted to change his name and pronouns. And then a couple months later, I discovered that he was going by a different name on the Zooms. Um, and I, well, not a couple months later, right away I found out and I emailed the counselor and I gave her all this information of why this isn't a good idea and that we weren't okay with it. And she completely ignored us. And um, I tried to, she didn't even respond. I emailed again, she didn't respond and it was COVID. So we couldn't like go to the school. It, she was home. And so we were just locked out. And then I, I didn't push it because I was super afraid of being having CPS called. Um, so I just kind of tried to just talk to my son about it. And um, so that's what happened to us. But then later he had a, a teacher that um, sort of befriended him and they started um, a, a girl at his school started a transgender club and this his home room teacher was ahead of it and so and then that was like a red flag for me and um, then I saw some emails from this teacher to my son just completely um, supporting it and affirming it and being a cheerleader and I got a little bit concerned about this teacher and then I saw an email where he gave him the number of the LA the LGBT um, center for housing and a phone number when he was a minor so this teacher was actively trying to help him move out of our house um, and if if a teacher was concerned about a, a kid, why wouldn't they call CPS first? Why would they try to help a kid move out of our house? And, um, and then later, once my son turned 18, he um, sent him a message saying, um, I just spoke to the guy at the LGBT center. He gave me the following numbers, a legal support number, housing, medical, and he said, and this was the email to my son. He said, he told me that he wants you to call him at the above number. Make sure to say that um, this teacher, I won't give his name, uh, call him this morning for referral numbers. He will help you obtain a medical card, separate from your parents' insurance for the time being with legal helps you to take control of your life. And this is what the teacher emailed my son, which I found. Um, and he was 18 at the time. Oh, wow. Um, boy, that's, that's a lot to process. Um, Jennifer, would you like to add to that? Yes. Um, so my daughter was very young. She was in fifth grade when this happened. Uh, so she was 10 at the beginning of the year and then she turned 11 during that school year. Um, and, and like Lauren was saying, I thought that, you know, I knew she was going through these 
Identi different identities, which I didn't even know to call them at that time, but I thought mm -hmm. it was like a natural exploration, identity exploration, and I didn't really take it that seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And I did not, it never occurred to me that the adults at school were taking it seriously and that they were supporting it behind my back um, that I just never would have dreamed. And I volunteered at that school for 11 years. This was the first year I wasn't a volunteer up there because I started my own business and this happened. Um, what, what happened with my daughter, she learned these ideas online. We allowed her to get into an online drawing group, which um, is where she learned these ideas. It wasn't DeviantArt. It was a different one that doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but <clears throat> that's where she learned them. And then she, you know, had a group of friends at school that were, you know, all LGBTQ. Um, and I, like I said, I just thought they were playing with these ideas. Um, and, and she started with aromantic and demisexual. Um, and I really didn't know that she had landed on transgender, um, until right before the pandemic. Uh, and apparently she had been using male pronouns. Her teacher had been using male pronouns for her from the very beginning of the school year. Um, and a, a, a couple months or if two or three months into the school year, she used the words cutting and suicide with a friend and which I now believe she learned online. Um, and I, the school counselor called me and very vigorously encouraged me to utilize a therapist that was contracted with the school. Um, you know, that she was free and she was very good at handling these kind handling these kinds of situations. And, and it was convenient because she was at the school um, because my daughter was under 13 and I am in the state of Washington. I had to give permission for that. Mm -hmm. So I came in and, uh, and at 13, I don't get to even say anything about it. This could happen without my knowledge or consent mm -hmm. um, in, in Washington. Uh, so I, I did, I, she seemed like a nice therapist. I thought she was somebody who was going to be working in partnership with me. I thought the school was working in partnership with me. Again, it never occurred to me that they wouldn't be. Um, it never occurred to me that they would have any, you know, any, feeling that I was dangerous to my, or potentially dangerous to my child. Um, so my daughter saw this therapist for, she had for two and a half months, um, a half hour session once a week. So that a total of five hours and, um, she, the therapist, and I asked several times throughout my daughter seeing this therapist, what they were discussing. Cause of course I was concerned about it and I didn't really get any information. Um, so I figured nothing significant had come up yet. <laughs> I thought that my daughter was being helped with some of the issues that I knew she was having with other peers at the school. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I got a call from the therapist right before the pandemic hit. Um, and she was letting me know that my daughter was, she was using male pronouns in the new made up name. Um, and she was letting my daughter letting me know that my daughter wanted to come out to us as a boy. She gave me three days. She, she was letting me know before she had this meeting, she wanted to have a meeting to help her do this. And she gave me three days to process that, you know, she called me on a Tuesday for a meeting on a Friday. Um, I was shocked at the time. Um, and, and I, and I spoke to my husband about it and he was very concerned because he thankfully for us had a friend who had gone through this a year before. And so he knew that there were some weird things happening with the schools. And um, he sort of pulled me back from, from really pushing more about it. Um, and we actually, we just pulled her out of school because it was, the pandemic was just starting and we just, we just pulled her out right away. Um, <clears throat> and, and then, you know, I homeschooled her through middle school uh, mm -hmm. and she, desisted. Um, and I believe that is because we, we took all of her devices away. She mm -hmm. was not hanging out with the same group of friends. Um, and she wasn't in that affirming environment where they were affirming the delusion that she was something other than what she is. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
and we really focused on her, you know, as a family. And, you know, we, we traveled around, we travel homeschooled and we in a camper and, um, anyway, it's, it, so it took her about a year and a half to, to desist, um, which is about the amount of time that I think it took her to get into it. Um, I found out afterwards <laughs> that, um, you know, I would have discussions with her about things and, and I asked, Oh, okay. So this was a significant thing that, that happened when the, when the therapist called, she said that my daughter wanted to be in the boys cabin for the overnight fifth grade overnight camp, which of course we were never going to say yes to. And actually my daughter later came to me and said she didn't even want to go to the camp. Um, you know, about a year later, or, or whatever, after she had desisted, I, I had a discussion with her about that. And I asked her, you know, what made you what gave you the idea? Like, I was surprised that she would even want to go in the boys cabin. And I was like, what made you ask that, you know, and, and she said, that wasn't, that wasn't my, what I asked for. That was what my teacher said. Uh, my teacher you know, asked if I wanted to be in the boys cabin and she had already said she was a boy and, you know, the whole school was going along with that. And I, she felt like she had to answer yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so this teacher wasn't asking her, what do you want? He was asking her, isn't this what you want? It was a leading question. And I see this happening. Um, you know, I, I, all of the mothers here, we're all in, in groups with lots of parents. So we, we hear the same stories over and over again. And I see this kind of thing happening in schools across the country where teachers, I, I think he thought he was being helpful, but he was, he was leading my daughter down a certain path. Yeah. And there's so many red flags in those stories. Um, these are adults in positions of authority over children. Um, and, uh, children will respect the opinions and the ideas of those adults. And so it's really critical, um, even thinking about the conduct, professional conduct, there's so many violations of what is appropriate, um, according to a number of policies that school districts have as far as adult child interaction as a high school cross country and track coach. Um, certainly I would have never been having individual offline conversations, you know, emailing, texting, that's absolutely prohibited in most districts that that is well outside the boundaries of professional conduct. Um, so those are things to keep in mind um, when we're sorting through this is the red flags, knowing who your children are having um, as trusted adults in their life in the school systems. And I do think that you know, we don't want to cast every school system, every teacher in a particular light. And I think um, it was well pointed out that there's a perception that this is helpful. Um, and more and more uh, school systems are adopting programs and training, um, which says this is how you should, as a teacher or as a administrator, uh, respond in these situations and in that push for affirmation um, to young people. But we're losing that um, separation and professional boundaries between adults and children. Tanya, can, if I could just add something, this is Lydia again. So one of the problems that we noticed at our independent school is when the rise of these transgender identified teens occurred, they went and got training from the local transgender resource center, which is associated with the gender clinic in our city. And they never went to, partly, I'm trying to give them some grace because I'm very angry, but they didn't really know where to go to get quality answers of what they should be doing. So they turned to the Transgender Resource Center. And I think that there's a lot of counselors, teachers, administrators who are looking for guidance and so they're going to things that are supposed to be, you know, trusted, what they think are scientific advocacy groups. The Transgender Resource Center, when I live, where, where I live, is absolutely full of propaganda. It's full of non-scientific information, poor medical practice. And because it is associated with the gender clinic at the university, they only have one correct response of any ethical teacher in their mind of what they're supposed to do. And so once that training happened at my kid's school, there is absolutely no way for a parent to push back or for even the teachers within the school to push back without mm -hmm. being labeled as being a problematic anti, well, it very, it very frustrates me, anti-LGB 
but a lot of the teachers are LGB. A lot of the parents support and are mm -hmm. LGB, but because the Transgender Resource Center has conflated those two together, you, it, it's just viewed as bigotry now, and there's no other resource for them to go to to get better information on, on what to do with these kids. Hey, Lydia, you've raised a couple of issues I want to follow up on. Do you notice or see any support or pushback from LGB parents um, against this conflation? Because obviously LGB is sexual, represents sexual orientation, and the TQ plus everything after that is more of a gender, gender identity. Do you see that um, LGB parents are largely supportive of or pushing back against the social transitioning? Within our parent groups online, there are a lot of LGB parents who are pushing back against this. Okay. In my own personal life, no, because mm -hmm. I think even more so, a lot of them are afraid of losing their community because I would say this at my kids school, the people who are pushing this the hardest are the parents who are regular heterosexual parents. Okay. They're very much pushing this. I don't hear a lot from the actual LGB parents and it's really difficult to have honest conversations about this with people because everyone's terrified to say what their real opinion is. Mm -hmm. So online, there's a lot in the groups I populate. There's a lot. But in person, it's been very, very difficult to make those connections. Because online you can be anonymous, so there's not as much risk, obviously. Well, and on, in our groups, everyone's been vetted. So we're not as afraid. Oh. Like I show my face in my group. I'm oh, not afraid okay. of, of showing my face in the group. And I, I know that we have several gay and lesbian parents in our group. And, okay. and they're very comfortable. But it, I think in we all have different challenges in being honest in our personal lives and they have different ones than I would, for example. Okay. You know, you also mentioned counseling and I know that medical counseling is either required or highly recommended in some states prior to receiving gender affirming care, but is there any sort of um, requirement for counseling for children? I mean, no level before <laughs> they socially transition? Absolutely Nothing. none, none. And not only is there none, but if you suggest it, you're also lumped into the bigot category. And if you do go to counseling anymore, it's a rubber stamp. You, The counselors will advertise online and say, I will give you a letter for transition. So even in states where they do have psychological and counseling requirements to transition, the a lot of the therapeutic community is providing a rubber stamp because they view it as unethical to re to to label this as a mental health issue. So um, in where I am, you're not allowed to get medical treatment without parental permission before 16. But in other places, it's 12. And wow. because there is no requirement for mental health, it's viewed as a an equity issue now. It's lumped mm -hmm. under equity. So if you suggest, well, my child is only 13 and I think that they need to go to counseling, um, not only are you misguided, you are a bigot and you are marginalizing your child and you're now an abusive parent and nobody's going to stop. Uh, no, There's no counselor or no doctor for a lot of us who've been willing to step up and just say no. And I'll just chime in and add to that just a little bit. And I do think this is where mental health and the medical community have completely failed these children, these parents, um, the school systems, and that they do look to medical and mental health as the experts. And once um, part of this is WPATH transitioning to their latest, um, what they call standard is standards of care, even though their standards of care don't meet minimum of what we would ever consider before, they are saying, get rid of the gatekeepers. And they use that language. Therapy means you're trying to limit access there. And it's in some states, it's being kind of spun as this conversion version of conversion therapy, which is is inaccurate. But people are afraid of losing their jobs, of their licenses, of their um, tenure if they work with a university. So here, it's a firm often an early or find a different job. Um, and so there is a. I do think there are thousands and thousands of physicians and of counselors and therapists that want to do differently, and we've got to encourage them to stand up and say this is not okay. You know, I think we're seeing in the past 
at least I am in the last two years, like you, you just alluded to, just this dramatic failing of the medical and the scientific community. And, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering when it comes to not providing counseling before, you know, a child makes a decision to socially transition, is there, is there any sort of um, discussion that's had in schools about informed consent? Does informed consent even enter the, the, the conversation when this, it's, it's not part of the conversation at all. And I know informed consent usually is about gender, you know, uh, gender affirming care, but um, I'm just, I'm thinking of in, in informed consent in, the, in terms of like the, the ramifications of someone just psychologically changing their gender. There's, okay. And that, that's what been one of a really, it's a good, I think we're getting a lot of movement on that front in the, and that's where there's, it's so important to recognize participating in the social transitioning of a child is a, an active therapeutic process. So mm -hmm. it's, I think initially maybe there was this, well, this is just supporting and including, but mm -hmm. when, and you guys spoke about this earlier, that idea of it's not neutral to when a child walks in and says, I want to change my pronouns. I'm going to change my name to say, oh, I'm so proud of you. You're, you're identifying as your true self. And this is so wonderful. That's not neutral as the adults in the room. And your turn, you're taking that role of either, you know, a school counselor, or a lot of times a teacher, they're not certified from a mental health perspective, nor should they be applying psychological um, mm -hmm. processes within that classroom. It's not an objective, um, safe setting. It's in a group. And so you're doing these things in a very conflated way. That's very confusing to the child and very harmful, but it's locking them in. The child thinks I can't switch now. This is my favorite math teacher. So, oh my gosh, or my favorite cross country coach. I, I can't go back because they, they probably only like me for who I am because I've said this. Mm -hmm. um, Can I jump a, in on that? Yeah, sure. sure. Oh, absolutely. Because I know, um, I, I, I know several parents that whose kids were willing to go to another school, were willing to move in order to back out of it because it's so hard once they've, this is like jumping off a cliff. It's like, you know, you get the whole school to um, be a part of this and, uh, you know, think how hard that would be for an adult even to turn around something like that. It's very hard, very difficult for a child. And so they are definitely putting them in a position um, I'd like to say something. Um, there was a, um, last week, um, Segum had a conference and one of the speakers was named Alex um, Capo. And he um, has a school back East and he decided they were not going to allow the kids to have new names. So when the kid came in to the school, they said, we, it's a small school, but he said, we don't use, we only use birth names and birth pronouns. And so that's what they did. And the, the kids that were trans identified all, all desisted. So when wow. it's not, when it's not, um, when the adults in the room are not going along with it, it makes all the difference in the world. So I don't understand why, um, that they don't understand that in like for my son in middle school, they had a trans person come and give an assembly and that planted the seed in my son's head. And he had come home from school that day and said, um, I didn't know you could be born in the wrong body. And I wasn't home. I was at work. And my husband said, he didn't even think anything of it. Cause my son had always been so secure with himself. Like, like, I mean, you know, we had no idea that this was a thing at the time. So they plant the seed and I'm in Los Angeles. And last week they had a coming out week for elementary students. So this is just planting the seed to every yeah. single student. LA Unified is the largest, largest school district in the country. It may be New York's bigger. I don't know, but I think it's one of the largest. And every single elementary school was indoctrinated last week wow. to the idea that you can be, you might not be a boy or a girl. And it's insane. And this is being, this is happening in the schools. 
Yeah, and that is a really um, good point as far as individual um, parent and child choices um, impacting a broader community, um, and that it is that the, that there's more children who are told to go with this. And so, a lot of parent advocates um, are concerned that you're teaching my children something that we don't agree with, we don't believe in, we want to be supportive. We we want to ensure that every student has the opportunity to thrive, um, but I don't want you teaching my child this. So that different, that there's no longer a separation between um, supporting the uh, choices of one parent and child and um, everybody else uh, in the in the school, in the class um, are being brought along in this journey. So it's, it's not just one student and one choice anymore. And I think that's something that we really need to think about um, in terms of the rights of parents and um, what schools are doing in the intention to support that's impacting more students. These are these are really great great questions, um, and uh, and and thank I thank our panelists for really diving deep into these issues. But now we are going to um, we're going to go to some of the questions that our viewers have posed, uh, and there's so many. I'm trying to get to just the ones that are jumping out at me. Well, we're going to start with uh, with Allison Allen. Like Lydia, our school is a private, independent school with a religious. Quaker affiliation. This presents certain other wrinkles. What can you say about this? Does anyone want to take that question? Well, I can just jump in a little bit, I suppose. This is Lydia. Um, in some ways, it, it's been very frustrating for me in a lot of the discourse surrounding this, where people are saying, oh, just pull your kid out of public school and put him into private because the problem is the public schools. The problem is everywhere. This is a society-wide problem. I don't think that there are quote unquote safe schools necessarily out there for your kids because this is not being, it is being pushed through the schools. I don't wanna discount that. I absolutely believe that it is, but it's also become the zitgeist of the teenagers and the children. So if your children have contact with other children, they're gonna hear about this as well. That being said, in some ways, some of the public schools, depending on where you are, you have more of an ability to push back because it is public and you have certain rights in public school that you don't have in private school. And that has been part of the problem that our family has had to deal with because our son is profoundly gifted. He was not able to function in the public school, which is why he was put out into the gifted private school. So we in some ways have less rights to certain information in the private school than we do in the public. I've also found that sometimes when you're in the private schools, especially ones with religious affiliations, you might think that that's a safer environment because, you know, you've got some tethered to a higher power or um, some sort of other social inhibitions against this but the truth of it is is that it only requires a few adults at the school to really be in favor of kindness over reality and you've you've kind of lost the war anyway so i don't hmm. know that there's a simple answer i think that this is a society-wide problem um it's definitely captured kids and adults and i i wish i could just say oh yeah you know Go to public, no, go to private, no homeschool. We've got people from every single one of those categories in our parent groups. There's no safe place if you've got affirming adults in your child's life. And, and that's been a really hard thing to reconcile. It's still surprising that the administration in a Quaker school would allow a few, um, a few teachers to affirm something that the school itself, just as a general principle, doesn't um, support. That's what's so surprising to me. It seems like it, it's like one of the, the, the question was saying, it seems like it really conflicts with the fundamental ideology of a religious school. So I, it's correct. It's, the, Catholic <laughs> school, the Catholic school here is one of the most prolific for trans identified kids. My and we had parents complaining that they sent their kids to the Catholic school to get them away from some of this other stuff and and the Catholic schools rife with it. Oh my God. Wow. You know, I think that uh, everybody is, actually, especially religious um, 
groups mm-hmm. are very afraid as of being called bigots. Um, and that's the position that they've been put in, you know, that um, <laughs> it's assumed often that if you are religious, that you're going to reject your child. And, you know, like we have a mom down in California who they assume that and they took her daughter away from her, Abigail uh, Martinez. And, um, you know, her daughter, that they helped her daughter transition and her daughter then took her life because it didn't help make her feel better. Um, but they assumed that this mother wouldn't support her daughter because she's religious. So that's that's pretty frightening, too, I think, for parents and everyone. <laughs> We've actually seen that in some of the training with the sample questions um, that teachers are guided through that says this is a student coming from this kind of home. Um, and it's actually embedding those assumptions further um, in through those trainings as well. And you're absolutely right. There's um, the, we need to kind of step back from all of those assumptions, beginning with the fact that, you know, a parent wants to harm their child. Um, the, the assumptions have gone the opposite direction. They've taken a 180 where we've always assumed um, especially in education, that if a teacher is beginning to observe um, different behavior patterns, patterns, the first place you go is the parent, because that's a signal um, that that child may be experiencing something concerning. Um, and the educators have typically gone back directly to the parent, and it's just completely flipped and changed um, at this point in time. And just to add to that, I think one of the one of the things to keep in mind, and I tell teachers this as well as parents, listen to your intuition. That intuition, you know your child better than anyone else, and you've known them longer than anyone else. Any of these folks in their lives are there for maybe a grade or two at most, but recognize that the research has not changed, and it's unbelievably robust when it comes to child development, that that Mm -hmm. child-parent or caregiver-parent relationship is the most important in promoting resilience, especially in adversity, but resilience, and if if you're driving and pushing secrecy right out of the gate assuming that, well, most parents are probably abusive and or this would be a dangerous situation for any child coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, your That secrecy from the most important support system in a child's life is so dangerous when they are emotionally struggling. So the psychological and emotional harm that's being done by building it into training, by building, I mean, these teachers, they know child development. Um, this is built into all um, you know, child development programs. So that has not changed. And that's where seeing it flipped on its head like this is so dangerous. And I'd like to add that um, they always use the suicide as mm-hmm. a reason that they don't tell the parents. But if a child was suicidal, the parents are the first person that need to be told because what are they going to do? The kid does say a kid does commit suicide where do they where where are they in that you know like they didn't tell the parents I mean that would be a huge lawsuit and I don't understand why the, it's framed that way um mm-hmm. that the parents can't um be a part of this because it just puts a wedge between your child and the school You know, so the parent is the bad guy, the school is the savior and the kid's the victim. And that is not healthy for a child. And it, 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 the child is leading this and that's not healthy for a child. Everything they're doing is not, is not in the kid's best interest. We have, we have so many great questions and I want to get to the next one, but I was wondering if I could just follow up on, I think something you said a few questions back, Lydia, um, and this is just a it's it's a it's a general question that it's for the group. Anyone who wants to chime in, but do any of you have any theories, um, thoughts uh, about why gender dysphoria a is so popular now, b is being actively pushed, and c is not being resisted by the the establishments, um, whether education in the education and the medical profession, the scientific specific, pro, pro, scientific profession that we would normally expect to provide some sort of guidance and reason. Why is this happening? Any any ideas, people? Oh, I have a lot of ideas. Oh, I can talk about hours. What do you have? Well, the first thing I think is that people are very, very worried about repeating ba- past mistakes. They hmm. don't want 
to be the bad guys in another civil rights movement. They don't want to be the bad guys in another um, anti-gay movement. Um, I think a lot of <laughs> a lot of people grew up with the after school movies about, you know, this poor kid who was just a little bit more gay than everyone else. And his parents threw him out of the house and he had to live on the streets. Nobody wants to be that person that nobody wants to do that. And so everyone's bending over backwards to show they're not that person. They're not a bad person. Okay. And I think that's coupled with the fact that most of the people that I've spoken to in real life about this don't understand it. So they're just going along with what seems to be kind. And they don't understand that it's not kind to tell somebody that there's something so wrong with them that they have to take medications and cut off body parts to be acceptable. It, it actually really breaks my heart to see how many kids are no longer gay. I, I don't know how to, else to say that, but yes, I work I at a college and I hardly have any gay students anymore. They're all trans. I have beautiful students who I can tell are lesbians and they're, they're men now. And I think, no, you're a beautiful lesbian girl. There's nothing wrong with that. Be who you are. I have young gay men in my classes who are very obviously gay. Nope. They're girls now. And it, it, so I think that there's actually a little bit of a homophobia strain in a lot of this for people, which yes. does really upset me. And I don't, I don't, when I talk to people and I say, so you're okay with all of these gay kids converting themselves to the opposite sex and not being able to have a sex life and not being able to grow up healthy. Like that's, that's what you think is a good thing. And or, no, no, I don't think that's a good thing. I actually had, um, a relative of mine who is a gay woman mm -hmm. say to me, maybe there aren't actually that many gay people. Maybe we've just been missing all the trans ones. Wow. I, I can't. So I think that there's a lot of really weird stuff going on right now. And I think a lot of it comes from people trying to be nice and also still be completely homophobic. As strange as that sounds, I, and I think the medical community is making a lot of money off of this. Mm -hmm. They don't want to push back on it. And I think the last part I'll say for now is that um, we've become so polarized as a society that if red team says trans is bad, blue team has to say trans is good. And that's the end of it. If you want to be on the blue team, you can't be, you know, and if, and if you say I'm actually okay with gay people, I think that there's a lot of really awesome people out there who are also gay, then you can't be on red team. And I, I just can't wrap my head around it. It's a very good point about the homophobia. It's also, this movement's also sexist in a way because it presumes that in order to be a girl, you have to look a certain way. And if you are a girl who wants to wear, you know, like I was, I was a tomboy, then all of us, all of a sudden you're a boy, instead of just saying, Hey, maybe there's a wide range of what girls could look like. I mean, <laughs> without having penises, of course. But um, yeah, it's it's always struck me as we're entering a very binary way of looking at sex as yes. we're trying to tell people, oh, we're not, we're not, we're every, it's cool to be non-binary. It's very con conflicting. Um, okay, another good question here, which is uh, what questions should, would you ask a school before anything happens to find out what the danger of indoctrination and information might be? For being preemptive in other words. Yeah, yeah, I think, oh, go ahead. Well, okay, I'm just going to say quickly say, I think that's a really difficult one um, because once you say something to school, you're marked then as potentially dangerous to your child. Um, mm -hmm. And they might not share anything with you then. And they might go ahead and do everything you don't, you ask them not to do. Um, they'll just keep you in the dark and they'll then, you know, create this conspiracy, school wide conspiracy, you know, to keep everything from this parent. So, Oh, that's all I have to say about that. If you want to jump in, Lydia. Well, I was going to add that most districts, um, public schools have their policies um, available, right? They're published, um, they're clear, the policies and the procedures. Um, you could also ask about what type of training um, are teachers um, being involved in or being um, provided in regard to um, a wide range of topics for your child that you're just interested in learning about 
Um, what type of professional development do they have in terms of um, supporting your child at school or supporting um, the student body at school? So you can ask very um, fair questions about um, the policies and procedures and training of the school. You can also ask um, who uh, who are their consultants, or you can look at information about who uh, school districts are paying um, to deliver training, what organizations are working with. Much of this is publicly disclosed. And that's one of the challenges as I work with parents is to help them understand where can you go and find information and what are the questions that you can and should be asking um, in a very neutral way, because we all deserve to understand um, what our children are experiencing at school and how the school is creating policies that create the culture for our children at school. I, I think another thing to look at is if your school has a health center attached to it. A lot of schools that have health centers attached um, provide a wide range of interventions without parental consent. So I know that there are health centers attached that will do um, contraception, um, that will do STDs tests, that will give out flu shots. Okay. And then now they're getting into some of the referrals. I'm not saying that there are schools that are providing puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, but they are allowing students to go into the clinic and get referrals to places who can provide that medical intervention. You know, Josie, um, since you're extremely active in this area and you run a sub substack, I was wondering if you could take this, uh, this question. Um, how can we inoculate our children in our homes before they arrive at any kind of school? What is a healthy way to explain this, this madness to a, a child who's in pre-kindergarten or, or any age? I well, I would just be very uh, sex positive and I would just tell the child, you, if they're a boy or a girl, that you will always be a boy and you will grow up to be a man no matter what anyone tells you. And you just need to push um that agenda and there's a book called hold on to your kids which i think they'll put in the um which just sh that so that you can learn how to hold on you know use uh lo show love to your child so that they can't they don't end up getting indoctrinated by other people and you have to explain that your teacher might not always have the right answer or, or might not know everything. And you can try and give them examples of that, but um, it's very hard. Um, and it was something that you never thought you needed to do, mm -hmm. but now you need to do that. You need to explain that, that where the truth is. And Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? I do. There was, um, you know, I think one of the things that I encourage is just that, again, that parent-child relationship um, in all of this, knowing that at home, be talking early and often with your kids at a developmentally appropriate level. If it's pre-K, it's, yeah, the idea of let's talk about um, boys and girls. What I hear a lot too is, you know, teachers or psychologists even, or, you know, affirming physicians saying, well, no one's ever promising that we're going to change your chromosomes with this. Well, in pre-K or a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old, there's so much conflation of, well, I don't know about chromosomes, but I'm just wanting to, I was, they're telling me I'm born in a different body. So there still is an underlying magical thinking about, but yes, I can change. And I just have to dress a little different and ask for these things. And then I get medicine and then I get my new structures that are going to be, I'm just going to be the opposite sex. And that's where if you can start early and often, I, it's never been, there's never been a time in psychological or psychiatric history where we've said, you're right. You were born in the wrong body. Therefore, everything about you that you're feeling that doesn't feel right or secure, that's correct. You're wrong. Everything about you is wrong. And that just psychologically, I, I don't understand it. But I think if you can just love your kids, be compassionate, answer questions, they'll ask questions and just encourage those questions often too. You're the parent and they will take you with them to school and be able to pick up on this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think relying on that connection if you can. You know, Lauren, there's another good question that you might be able to, to, to handle, and it sort of picks up on where we were talking about um, the homophobic and 
sexist nature of this ideology. So the question is gender ideology itself seems to be both heterosexist and also insensitive to different cultural and family beliefs, for example, Muslims and just, uh, you know, has there been any uh, concerted pushback with respect to um, our cultural competency um, or an approach that challenges the heteronormity assumptions of gender ideology or even the religious um, or lack of religious um, ideology? Well, and that's, I think, when something that is seen or presented in some ways as either a mental health struggle or um, mental challenge versus a, a, this shouldn't be called, you know, a type of dysphoria, but treatment's the same, if that makes sense. You know, if a child is dysphoric about something, gender included, well, then we've got to treat and medicalize and all this. But then what's getting looped in is more of the civil rights side, the identity side of it. Um, well, don't call this a, a disorder. Don't call this, but still provide the path that leads to medicalization. I think that's where religious, um, cultural things kind of just drop and fall by the wayside. Because again, it's like, well, this is the treatment that's going to keep your child, regardless of religion or, or culture, safe, alive. It's this conflation of medical treatment with identity. And I think that's where it gets very confusing. Parents want, I think for the most part, to do the very best they can for their child. And if someone is saying, hey, they're identifying this way and that's against your religious or cultural beliefs, get on board or they're gonna kill themselves. And I think that's emotional manipulation. I think it's cruel. I think it it gives a, almost a diagnostic um, value to suicidality, which is opposite of what we would ever do. If someone's suicidal, it's a hard stop. You treat and you know you provide safety and stability first, and then you look at other things. But I I don't I don't know if that answered it completely. But um, yeah, I think so. Um, so this is another good question. It goes to the concept of there's no pl safe place to go. Someone has a very practical question. Any thoughts on if moving to a more conservative state actually helps parents? <laughs> Oh man, that that's a that's a really hard one. <laughs> well, I mean, I know of a family that did that. They moved to a small town in a red state, and the child next door was trans identified. So you you can't get away from it. I think you you can be aware of what laws your state is passing, um, and I do see uh, you there's the opportunity to understand or change districts or change locations depending on the legal parameters um, that govern that state that um, or that district. I One of the say, interesting, just put, I'm okay. sorry. I, I was just gonna say, I have a lot of family in Utah and you can't get much more red than Utah. And it's just as bad there as it is everywhere else. Oh, it's okay. fascinating. Um, okay. What do we know about the effect um, encouraging young children to question their sex on the development of their personality, how that will play out? I know we probably don't even have enough data now, but is there any any thoughts or speculation on how this could play out? There, I can certainly send out um, a few resources. Um, what we are seeing is Obviously, right now we just have short-term data, but a lot of the short-term data is we see um, more dysphoria and disruption to a, a child's stability. We see a decrease in flexibility of their sense of self, um, especially when they're in a school setting or a bigger community that's celebrating and it not, again, I don't want to sound like I'm saying don't support every child. We do want to support every child, but support and affirm are two totally different things. And when you're affirming this one piece of a child's identity above all else and celebrating it, that child feels like they can't maybe explore other nuances of who they are. They can't back out. Um, and so then what we do see, we do know this piece of it, social um, transition. Um, there's a, a tremendous number who end up feeling locked into, I've got to medicalize. As soon as you're on, on puberty blockers, um, just to pause, right? They they would argue that it's just a pause. We're just going to give them time to think. The problem is now you're sending everyone else in a child's peer group on through the not so great, sometimes challenges of puberty and it's awkward, and, but everybody else is moving forward. This child's left behind and we see that upwards of 98% will then go on to cross sex hormones because they feel they just don't have a choice. Um, they're more isolated. They feel more 
um, trapped in this. Um, so, but like you said, long-term data is not there um, in terms of just social transitioning and then what happens long-term. I think you brought up a really good point about flattening identity, though. When we think about public education and um, the pursuit of ensuring that students have the opportunity to learn about all of the different things that they're good at, all of the different things that they are as part of their innate personality and unique um, humanness, um, how they have access to sports, to music, to curriculum, and flattening all that down to making this the single most important thing about you is um, really uh, um, uh, frightening, traumatic, and I think it's um, causing students to feel more and more isolated instead of embracing all of the ways that um, we are uniquely made and designed and capable in this world. And I think to add to that, and I think I've even shifted on this since all of this started with um, pronouns um, and requesting not just that you tell a classroom, for example, here are the pronouns this child wants to use, but telling everyone they need to proclaim them, including the adults in the room. And what that does is, at, especially in young children, developmentally, they're in they're at all different places in their development, right? So they're trying to learn, they're trying to understand if they're thinking, well, I don't have this sense of gender identity that my friend does, or I don't know that I want to do that. There's this pressure that's not natural in that moment for that child. And, and it really, again, can create the sense of, well, something's wrong with me, why don't I feel that way? And then it can, again, it can be very distressing and especially in a group setting. Um, kids we know behave very differently in a group setting. They also don't wanna be called out for being a, a bully or not being supportive. And so it takes advantage of just the compassion and the emotional support children want to give each other. And so I think you have to look at what psychologically are we doing. You know, um, so we don't have long-term data. Um, Lauren, you said that, but I'm just wondering to our parents, um, Josie, Lydia, Jennifer, are you noticing any immediate developmental impacts from transition in your children? Well, my son declared he was trans in October. By May, he was psychiatrically institutionalized for self-harm by the police. We were doing our best to walk the tightrope of loving him without saying that this was a good idea. We um, did use the name because we were strong armed into it against our will by the first therapist that we saw who did give us the suicide line. Um, and by January, he was, he had developed an eating disorder and was cutting. And by May, he had to be institutionalized for self-harm. So even though everyone around him was affirming him, even us to a certain degree, although we were not allowing him to medicalize, which he wanted right away, within six months, his psychological um, health had completely plummeted. And it was only when we just kind of put our foot down and said, we're not going to participate in this. He started it got worse. I'm not going to say, and then it all got better. I mean, we've been through the ringer for the last three years, but it didn't make it worse when we said no, hmm. it didn't and make I, it worse. Go oh. ahead, Joe. I was going to say, um, my son completely deteriorated after we had gone to a doctor and that doctor affirmed, which we had no idea because we were completely blindsided about all this. We thought that he would do an evaluation or tests or something. And that's not what happened. He, com he completely affirmed it, said, would you rather want have a dead son or a live daughter? And we were just so shocked that this doctor said this, that my and then immediately my son went downhill as far as he had never been depressed in his life he was a really happy go lucky kid and all of a sudden he was completely depressed he quit sports he quit boy scouts he quit everything that he used to do and and it just he was a straight a student he barely graduated high school i mean it did a number on his his psyche and um we did say no but i um he has since um estranged from us because we said no but we didn't 
I couldn't affirm a lie. I couldn't affirm that. And I don't know. It, it's not good for their mental health. And it's not good for an emerging adult either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I will say the same thing happened with my daughter when she was, you know, thinking this way. She was not happy and, and healthy, behaving in a healthy way. And, and I think it's, it's just really a negative feedback loop. Um, you know, it is very much telling you your body's wrong. There's people out there who hate you. Um, <clears throat> and it's, um, I don't, yeah, I see this with many kids, they, their, their health, their mental health deteriorates when they, when they go down this route. And when we pulled our daughter out, um, and removed her from all the affirming, affirming influences, um, her mood drastically changed so much so that the neighbors noticed it, you know, she's in, she's looks so great. She's in such a good mood. So that was after we pulled her out of that. Wow. And um, lots of parents I know whose kids have desisted will say their kid is the happiest they've been. It, they can't even remember like that they're so happy now and that before they were miserable. I, I just want to make one point, yeah. sorry, about the, 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 the fact that, that my daughter was very young um, made it a lot easier, I think, for us to pull her out of it because she wasn't in that um, quite to that individuating or maybe at the very beginning of that individuating process. I just, I want to put that out there so that people understand that. Um, I know there's parents that have done probably the same things that I did um, and are still in it with their kids. So it's, it's easier when they're younger. Uh, Lydia, Lydia well, Josie, I'm sorry, your, your experiences in particular um, where your children, uh, you know, radically de deteriorated mentally following transition. Did you, with this information, did you bring this information back to your, your school, your teachers and administrators as sort of like um well, you know, this is a case study, what, ha what can happen? Are you not more, will you not be more sensitive to, you know, funneling kids in this direction, given what happened to our children? Did they, did they respond at all? Did you bring this information to their attention? Um, in my case, yes. He, <laughs> my son was in a pact with some of the other trans identified kids. Mm -hmm. They were all cutting together. They were flirting with anorexia together. They were, the reason the police came to our house is because he was in the school discord server telling everybody the self-harm he was perpetuating that night. And one of the parents found it and called the police, which I'm very grateful for. The school does know. Um, the school, their heart goes out to us, but... Hmm. They're not going to push back against this. Um, it's just more, I, I, we just got run around. I mean, we absolutely just got run around and it took us a while to realize that that's what was happening. I do beat myself up all the time that we didn't pull him out back then, but I mean, he's over 18 now. Now there's not much we can do. And, and I don't know that... I, I had so many conversations with the school during that time period and they would act like they got it. And then they would just keep doing what they were doing before. Hmm. I wouldn't find out about it until later. So they, they, I think for a lot of them, they're just being cowards. They don't want to have to deal with the conflict. Hmm. In my case, um, the teacher that tried to help him find housing out of our house, um, we tried to have meetings with him and he would always blow us off. And um, it was sort of during COVID. So we were not allowed to go to the school. We wouldn't be able to get into the school because of COVID. So once they went back and so Otherwise, we would have gone to the school and demanded this guy talk to us, but we couldn't do that. So COVID kept us from um, preventing us from doing anything, even though we wrote letters, but we'd never get a response. Hmm. And it is harder when they're older, like Jennifer said. It, it's a lot harder when they're older. 
because they are individuating. And one of the things a lot of the parents in our groups have noticed is that you do set up this triangulation where the parents are the bad guys, the kids are the victims, and the school is the savior. And if you keep pushing back against this with the school, you end up entrenching that triangulation disorder even further. And when you're in a state like I am, where CPS can get called on you for not affirming your kid, especially I have younger kids, like it, I couldn't risk, I couldn't risk my younger kids. And it's just, it's a really scary place to be because in some ways the school does hold the entire safety of your entire family in their hands. And you do feel very, very powerless in those situations, especially when you're dealing with the hospital and the psychologists and, you know, the social worker that's been assigned to your family because your kid ended up in the hospital and the police, you just don't have the emotional energy or the time to fight the school too. And I think to add to that, don't forget these children are hearing either online or in sometimes by providers, unfortunately, or by therapists that your negative emotions or your decline, um, if you decline emotionally, it can't be from the social transition or the medicalization, because if you're really trans, quote unquote, then these would only feel better. So there's this added complex pressure on very young children that, you no, know, you have to stick with this because maybe you were lying if you have side effects, which is baffling. You know, if someone came in and I treated them for depression and gave them a medication that works for some, but they had, you know, side effects they couldn't tolerate, I wouldn't say, well, then you're lying about your depression. Um, it's that's, but these children are being told that to the point where they won't even talk with teachers or faculty about, Hey, I don't feel good about this or talk to, if they're on blockers or something else to go into the provider and saying, this feels terrible um, because they're afraid they're going to not continue to receive that support. So there's some really confusing messaging about you're going to be excommunicated from a community that you feel like you identify with, but they may reject you. And Oh, we, this is this is a pretty good question, Lauren. You can probably take this as well. And uh, this sort of goes to the issue we discussed earlier about the um, disproportionate number of children experience, experiencing dysphoria, dysphoria who also have mental um, challenges. So the question is: Are there any tips on how to find a non-affirming psychiatrist for medication management? Well, I would say, and I think this probably speaks to the bigger global problem. Most of the time, like for example, as a psychiatrist, I don't prescribe hormones in general, um, right? We're not endocrinologists. Um, and so a lot of times we see the splintering of the medical versus psychological support. Um, but going back to trying to find a provider that's quote unquote, non-affirming. Um, I actually, that was one of the appendix um, sections that I wrote in Dr. Grossman's book was, you know, how to vet a therapist, how to look for a therapist that isn't going to just blindly affirm. Um, and then of course you could apply it to a psychiatrist or other provider. The problem is, and I've actually had phone calls about it and worked to improve advice on it is that when you ask most of the time, especially a mental health provider is going to say, why are you asking? I'm not going to answer that question. There's a fear that perhaps, you know, I mean, I'll answer it, but I think the fear is if you say, I don't affirm quote unquote, now mm -hmm. it's there, you're going to be called out for doing something illegal or, you know, and, and so I think that's where, or you're going to be called up by your board. Um, because in so many States, especially it's affirm or lose your license. Um, and I think that, I think that's more of a perception than it is, you know, actually taking place, but I have yet to have someone be able to reach out and to an actual therapist or psychiatrist and then say, no, I don't take this approach. I actually take a more comprehensive, exploratory, developmentally appropriate, medically safe approach. Um, to me, that's just good medicine. But does that, so I think that's where there's this, I, I would love to say that that works every time um, to be able to reach out and say, hey, I need to know how you explore this, how you approach it. Um, and a lot of times though, they'll get shut down. Now, is this coming from the American Medical Association or? The American they... Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, the um, American Psychiatric Association. Uh, I have yet to see a 
one of the big American um, medical mm -hmm. associations or or specialties um, go a different route. If we, we've noticed in Europe, and particularly in England, there's been a real pushback, and we saw that happen with Tavistock. Are there? I mean, is that? Do you expect that to sort of trickle over here at some point, or is are we just completely different societies, and what happens there will not make it here for for a variety um, of reasons? I I am going to stay um, optimistic and hopeful. Um, what I do see, and I participate a lot in the, in GenSpec um, activities, and um, what's wonderful about them is they really take. We have so many international folks involved in all of the countries. I think now there may be 11 or more um, that are absolutely saying hard stop um, in minors. This is not the direction we're going to go. We're going to take the traditional psychodynamic psychotherapeutic approach and recognize that is part of psychiatry. We have a tremendous amount of training in psychotherapy and utilize that as one of the most important medical treatments. Um, we want to try and avoid med you know, medicalizing or medicine at all costs, but that being said, there are folks right now in Europe going, what are you guys doing? We're now coming out with more and more data, handing it over to you right now in real time and saying, please pay attention to this. And I think part of this is kind of just more my theory is there's so much, um, I think, just little pockets of medicine and it's so decentralized. Um, which mm. is not, it's not, I'm not saying that that's bad in a lot of ways in this particular situation, because it's impossible to follow the hundreds of gender clinics out there. Um, and the thousands or maybe tens of thousands of providers that are doing it independently. We just, we don't have any way of doing it the way some of these countries have right now. So that's kind of what we're up against. Um, but I will tell you there are, it, I think we just, education is gonna be the key to this. I don't think we wait to see how much harm comes from this um, before pulling back. And I hope that we do. Okay. Um, okay. Well, thank you. I, uh, we're coming up towards the close of our webinar now. Uh, I'd like to just probably take this opportunity to see if anyone has any closing comments, final thoughts to share with our, our, our audience. Um, yeah, I do. Um, you had earlier asked me about what you can, a parent can do. I also wanted to um, bring up that um, right before puberty, you should really talk to your child about how difficult puberty is and um, explain to them that it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's going to be uncomfortable. So plant the seed that it, it doesn't mean you're trans if you're going if you feel uncomfortable with your body, that's normal. And just normalize the, the real experiences and, and body positivity, you know, just praise them all the time, give them lots of love and hugs. And um, somebody put in the chat, uh, body and me, and, you know, go back to the, some of the things that we were saying in the eighties about body positivity, you know, um, and that's all I want to say. And um, thank you for um, having us here. I appreciate it. And um, I do want to say that I got some good news from my son this week, and maybe he's moving out of this. So, um, you know, you just have to hang in there. That's encouraging. So I, I'll have one more thing to add. Um, again, thank you for having this. I haven't really spoken about this publicly for a lot of reasons. So it's really great to have a place where I can talk about what our experience has been. The other thing I'd like to add is I would also suggest to parents that they really watch their kids' media. I know that the internet gets thrown in a lot, but specifically, I think a lot of my son got pulled in through young adult fiction. He was a big reader. <laughs> So the Rick Riordan books that he loved when he was younger, they shifted. They're now full of gender ideology towards the end. Um, there's a lot of young adult fiction out there that you're going to think, oh, that's okay. That's safe for my kid. They're not. They're all full of these characters. And if you have a kid like mine who gets really, really into fantasy and fiction, you need to start reading the books that they're reading. You can't just think, oh, I've locked down the internet. They don't have a smartphone because that was my family. You've also got to pay attention to things just like regular books, to the shows that they're watching on Netflix, 
things like that, that you wouldn't have thought 10 years ago. I mean, I was <laughs> always the parent who said, whatever you get at the library, I'm okay with you reading. And now I have to be the opposite of that parent. There's not a book that comes into my house or my younger kids that I haven't read first. Mm -hmm. And you just have to be really careful because that's one of the roots into our homes is through young adult fiction. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I just want to add that. And, and yes, thank you for having us. Really, this has been great. Um, and, and I just want to say about what talking to your parents kind of to go a little further with what Josie was saying is to really emphasize that, um, yes, you are born, you know, either a boy or a girl that never can be changed. Um, and, but you can be, your personality can be, you know, along any spec, the spectrum, right? You can be very feminine boy or a very masculine girl that will not change who you are. Um, and that, you know, you really like really push that you accept that, right? Like my daughter thinks of herself as very masculine and, and, and we've had discussions about that. And now she says, yeah, some people think that you can't be a masculine girl. And I'm like, I know. Right. You know, so to, to talk about that kind of stuff too. Thank you. Okay. Lauren, Lauren. Yep. Any thoughts? Sure. So just as I was trying to get a mute, um, but no, I just, I so appreciate you including me in on this. I, and I'm just so thankful to be here with such like brave parents that have been through so much. Um, you know, additionally, I would just double down on love your kids. Talk often support who they are and not just today, but who they are in their futures. Um, anything that's going to limit their futures, you know, you gotta, you've got to hold reality in the room for them until they can get to a developmental place where they can, um, you know, and take over for, you know, in that, but know that yes, puberty is a process. It's not a trauma to consent to. That's something I hear a lot. Um, so we've got to get back to kind of just teaching our kids, standing with them, um, loving them through ups and downs, um, but not just accepting what it is they want in that moment is good for them at all times. This is what the affirming model does versus, okay, let's, let's do better. Wonderful. And uh, Tanya, any thoughts? Yes. Um, build relationships with your children's trusted adults. Um, be involved in the school system, be involved at your school, um, know the adults, do that because it's it's for the benefit of your child, um, regardless. It's uh, There's so much positive that can come out of that and it prevents um, some of the concerns that we talked about today. Ask your child questions every day about their experience at school, make that part of your normal conversation um, because um, you're going to have to get precise about understanding what their experience is there. So um, just thank you for uh, taking on this topic and exploring it and never, ever, ever apologize for fighting for your child. This is your child. I tell every single parent advocate, this is your child. Never apologize for fighting for them and hang in there and find other parents that are going to fight with you. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion and we've provided some very valuable resources and books, links to books in the chat, please take a look and share it. And I'd also like to call out a, our Fairs Back to School Handbook, which has been, um, I think, an incredible resource already. It's We just put it out this fall, but there is a entire section uh, for parents to sort of guide them through the issues that we discussed today about um, uh, possibly, you know, running into social transitioning with your child. Um, and with that, um, just, I'm grateful to all our panelists for this ongoing conversation. I'm sure it's just going to continue, but I'm optimistic, um, as Lauren is, that we will turn a corner soon. Um, just know that Fair and Medicine is committed to providing parents an open and safe and respectful forum to discuss these issues, and we will continue to do that going forward. So stay tuned. If you're on our newsletter, we, you will definitely stay abreast of other webinars on this issue and other issues that are pertinent. So thank you again and um, hope all of you have a wonderful day.